all the stuff are normally scheduled broadcasting. Um, yeah, well, um, you know, if, if you've been around here any length of time, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty methodical uh, writer and planner. I mean, when I, write, when I write a message, I mean, it's like I'm putting a puzzle together. That's kind of how I approach it. And, uh, and I approached it that way in the back half of Romans chapter 8. Um, but but given, given the kind of the tenor and the theme of, of how they've led us in worship and how they led us to worship at 8 o'clock, I feel like that there's a lot more around this idea of God fighting for us um, than maybe some of all the little particulars I pulled out of Romans 8. So if you want that one in its puzzle detail, go, go back and watch it later. Some of you aren't laughing, so you don't know what, you have no idea what to expect. I got a suit on, and you're already, you know, you're confused, you're wondering what's going on. Um, just as us, you know, the kids did a pastor appreciation breakfast for us this morning. So some of the parents of the, of the children did that, had food back there for us and gave us cards. And um, so I received these two cards, and I read them back to back, and I, I, I'll read them to you before I get moving. Um, the first one was from Jackson Wooten. I've known Jackson since he was basically in a car carrier. And Jackson said, thank you, you're the best. I'm keeping that one. And then right after that, I opened this very next one. This was from Brody Orton. And Brody said, go UT, boo Georgia. Thank you for all you do. So, so I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep, those of you who are guests who don't know, I'm a big, I used to be a big University of Georgia fan. So as I'm, as I'm preaching through the, the, the back half of Romans 8 this morning, there was a, there was a verse of scripture that, that came to me, and I, and I said it, but I had no idea the context. And I said, this is the way walk ye in it, was what, was what came out. See, in, in Romans chapter 8, and I, I know I've confused everybody running the slides back there. Um, this is what I believe chapter, the back half specifically of chapter 8 teaches us, is that we can live each day in hope, not in fear. So if you can find that slide, that we can live each day in hope, not in fear. Fear has a way of capturing so much of our days. And, and, uh, and if you're not careful, if you're not careful and it goes unchecked, it swallows huge chunks of your time, huge portions of your life. But Romans, the back half of Romans H teaches that we can live each day in hope, not in fear. The second thing I think it teaches us is that we can leave, live each day as a conqueror and not as a victim. It's very easy to fall into I can't get out of this. Everybody's against me. Um, nothing ever works in my favor. How am I going to overcome this particular really big challenge? And it's so easy to live, maybe if not in a victim as cla the classic social sense of the word victim, but as in really there's no hope. I just got to wait this thing out. Okay? But I think Romans, back half of Romans 8 teaches that that's not, um, that's not the way we can live. And, this, and, the, and the third one, and there's probably a hundred, but the three that I came from is that we can live each day connected to God. We can live each day connected to God. It sounds like a simple thing, but I wonder how many times we live feeling like that we are detached. Or maybe, it's, let's say it this way, maybe you're feeling like you're alone. Maybe you feel like you are all in the fight by yourself. And so a lot of messages, the messages will be formed by saying, um, here are the five ways in which you can do these three things. Here are the five things Scripture teaches that you can follow in a path to do these things. And, you know, I preach those messages. But what I think the back half of Romans 8 teaches is that, that not, there's not five ways to do this, that this has already been done for us. That, that this has already been, this, all of these things have already been accomplished for us. So what, what becomes then the response to the things already accomplished for us? And that's where in the moment of that message at 8 o'clock, where, 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 where the phrase, the biblical phrase came to me was, this is the way, walk ye in it. That Romans 8 is this is the way, this is how, God has orchestrated the kingdom. This is what you should be walking in. It comes out of Isaiah chapter 30. Israel in, once again, in, um, in exile. And God is chastising them. But then in verse 15, it says, This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses, therefore you will flee. You said, we'll ride off on swift horses, therefore your pursuers will be swift. See, we, we many times, we try to make our own wins. 
our own escapes. We try to talk ourselves into our own good moods. And basically what, what God's thing, saying to Israel is, you can do that if that's your choice, but you're still going to be overcome. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, all of you are going to flee. Till all that's left is a flagstaff on a mountain like a banner on a hill. Basically the, the, um, the leftover of what really was. A symbol of what the army was, but no army. Then it says, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Then he says, O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more with your own eyes. You will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. And then you will defy your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold, and you will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, Away with you. So, Scripture really doesn't understand political correctness <laughs> or nice speech. It is, a, it is a very bold and a very emphatic passage that says we can, you can continue to try your way, but you will continue to be overcome by that even in your own way until all that's left is just a symbol of what you were. But there is a way in quietness and strength. And even when you're eating the bread and water of affliction, there is a way if you will walk in it. And so Romans 8, and um, because I'm not going to break it and read it like I have here, I'm, my NIV version, if you haven't um, realized the NIV got updated, and this is an old one, so it's going to be probably different from the screen. But when Paul is, he's, he's crescendoing the first half of this uh, treatise to this 100 um, Jewish the Greek, mostly Greek Christians living in a city in which the emperor is considered God. And, and so, but they're, they're existing in the city of over a million people. They're still existing. And, and even though this is the last thing Paul will write, he writes, all, of the, all the rest of his um, missionary journeys are already done. He, he's, he's already written the, the letters to the Corinthians and the Ephesians and the Galatians and, the, and Thessalonica. I mean, and this is kind of like this culmination of these years of preaching and thinking where he wants to synthesize as best as he can, maybe the, even beyond what we can understand, of what becomes the heart of the gospel and what to walk in. And the first eight chapters starts, kind of leads us through this idea of, well, we're, we're, we are at the place we are because God has allowed us to just live the way we want to live. That he hasn't given up on us, but he's turned us over just to live any way we want to live. We want to live that way, go ahead and live that way, and you're going to see the consequences of that. And then he demonstrates to us that there's only one way to faith, one way to a righteous, justified relationship with Christ, and that's through faith. Believing that he is who he says he is, that he did what he said he was going to do, and that he, he is the true God. And then he outlines the fact that, yes, we, there was wrath because of our sin. But we're dead to that wrath because Christ took all of that wrath on him on the cross. So we no longer, even though we were once enemies to God, we're no longer enemies to God. And that wrath is gone because it's been, it's not because it just evaporated. It was already satisfied. Jesus satisfies it. So then we're, we're dead to the wrath of God and we're also dead to sin. Sin used to be the master. It used to be the slave owner. It used to dictate all of our actions and yet now we're dead to that sin. That sin no longer has that kind of authority over us but now that Christ has authority over us. We've changed emperors. So we're dead to the wrath of God. We're dead to the power of sin and we're dead to the law. That, that the law was always intended. Uh, the law was never... Um, uh, it, it, what I'm trying to say, God did exactly what he intended to do with the law, but the enemy, the Satan, hijacked the law to bring guilt and condemnation on us, and that was never the purpose of the law, but the purpose of the law was always there to point us to a Savior, and it did that. So although we're free from the obligations of the law, the Spirit lives inside of us so that we can fulfill um, not the desires of the flesh, but the desires of the Spirit. 
And so he walks us through all of this and he gets to Romans 8. And now basically Romans 8 is telling us what's already been done for us. Will we walk in it? And so as we sing, he's fighting for us. The song carries with it two connotations to me. One is that he fights for us, but that he has already fought for us. Paul, throughout the book of Romans, really mentions basically what's been called a two-age motif. This idea that the kingdom of God has come with Christ, but it will come again with him. That we get something in measure, but we're going to get it in fullness. And right now we live in Christ, but there'll be a day in which we really live in Christ. Paul also says that we see through a glass darkly. That even this morning I prayed, Lord, let us see another shade into it. You know, I mean, can, can you peel back another layer of, of, of film so that we can see even more clearly? Because right now we get a piece of the kingdom, but we don't get the whole kingdom. So the hope, the true hope that we can have walking in now is that there is another hope. That we live in hope now, but it's not the culmination. It's not all of the hope that's present. And the fact of the matter is because that promise is that this life is not all there is, but there is a life to come, that's how we can walk in hope. And I see two different things happen with believers. I see them think that this life is all there is, or at least that's the way we live it. Because we end up grading God on a curve uh, on based on how we're walking through this life. Well, if there's too much hardship, God, what's the problem? God, what's the problem? You know, do you not love me as much today as you did yesterday? Did somehow I tripped up and made a mistake here and now I'm getting punished for it? We, we treat this life as all there is and that's the reaction. That's, how, that's an indication of that. And the other, the other uh, opposite error I see is that, you know, this real life really doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter what I do or how I do it. Um, there's going to be another life and I've just got to get through this one. I think both we miss out. We miss out on the kingdom now. We miss out on what the, the value of the kingdom is in the future. So, so in Romans 8, 12, it's kind of where I left off last time. Um, but just kind of as a recap, here it goes. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For you, if, if you live according to the sinful nature, you're going to die. But if, the spirit, um, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you're going to live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Let me say there's plenty of people... That, well, you hear, you hear it said, well, aren't we all children of God? I mean, that, that would be the political correct statement to say, well, we're all children of God. Well, I'm sorry, but we're not all children of God. Right. Now, we're all valued by God equally. The love of Christ was extended to all of us while we were enemies to God. But listen, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the Gospels and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He doesn't say, well, you know what? We're all children of God. We've all been created in His image. We have all been created in His image. But that's been corrupted by sin. And so to be born again is to recognize that sin has, do, has dominion and we are surrendering ourselves to God through repentance of our sin and then we become children of God. And to live like children of God is to be led by the Spirit. If we just continue to be led by the sinful desires in the flesh and stuff that just seems to always conquer us, where is this power that we've been given as children of God? Because we have been given it. We've been given the Spirit. He goes on. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. That's what the old nature, the sinful um, dominion brought us. It only brings death. It only brings destruction. It, only, it always overpromises and underdelivers. Always. It's always going to disappoint. It's always going to steal. And so the thinking might be if that was the old um, king, the old authority in my life, well, is this new authority in Christ? It's natural that there might be some kind of hesitation to it. But that's what Paul says. You didn't receive that kind of spirit. You received the spirit of sonship by which we cry, Abba, Father. A very um, personal um, description of Lord. You wouldn't necessarily want to see these things together. Lord is Lord. But Paul's qualifying, yes, Lord is Lord, but Lord also has the heart of a dad. This area has a lot of adoption. Anybody in here, you've adopted children? Raise your hand. you adopted children? Yeah, there's a couple of you adopted children, right? Okay, so adop I, you can see the joy in the parents' faces and lives when, when there's adoption. Because, you know, usually the kids are, or sometimes the kids are young, but you see the joy in the parents. But listen, about, I don't know, a month or so ago, I was in the courtroom when um, um, Tech, Phil and Vanessa Sokic adopts Tech, who is 18 years old. 
And, and basically, the, um, the, the, the judge lost all control of his courtroom because the majority of the student ministry was in there for that, and they were doing it at breaks. They do these things at breaks. So it wasn't the courtroom it wasn't filling people, and it was a break. And we flood in. Uh, he lost complete control because one of the students took the gavel. We got a picture with him behind everybody. And he was loving us being there. But what you loved to see was you saw the joy in Tech's face. See, it's hard to see the joy in a two-year-old's face, a three-year-old's face, five-year-old's face. But in Tech, what she understood was once, before adoption, there was no identity, no future. But see, what adoption brings to the children is it brings identity, hope, and a future. And so before we were adopted by Christ, we had no identity. There is no hope. There is no future. Now, but with adoption, being adopted by God, now my identity is his identity. I, I mean, it's, we're sons and daughters, and then we are co-heirs with Christ. And that language can get lost. Especially if you've been in church for a while, yeah, co-heirs with Christ. I mean, you think about being adopted. That's good enough, right? But what if that adopted family is royalty? I mean, what, what, what age do you have to get to before you realize that, whoa, I can have a motorcycle when I want it? I mean, you know, I mean, seriously, I mean, what, I mean, yeah, means doesn't always mean a great family, right? But what if you get a great family and you can go to Harvard? I mean, you know, what, what happens when you can put those two things together? And I think sometimes we forget that, that it's not just that we were rescued from sin, that somehow God looked upon us and felt sorry for us. Now, those poor guys. They don't have a shot without me. Yeah, okay, I'll step in. No, he was consumed, consumed from, from the creation of the world to be in relation with us. Consumed by it. And so that when sin comes, then the pattern of bringing that restoration begins at the very start of creation. As soon as, as, soon as sin happens, there's a plan in place for redemption. And so he longs not just to, to, to lavish us with his love, and his, but now his identity in him. And then the, this, the magnificence of the kingdom that we really don't have a good handle on. And I get it. I don't have a good handle on it either. But we have that as well. So, so for you do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship, by which we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit. That we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then heirs, heirs with God, co-heirs with Christ. Indeed, if we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And then, now as we go time out. Yeah, it said nothing about suffering. So I see equal heirs walking around here in, 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 with believers. One is that if I'm a, now if I'm a child of the king, there should be no more suffering. And if there's suffering, then I must be doing something wrong or God fell asleep at the wheel or something that there, there shouldn't be suffering. Um, here, here's, here's what he, the link he's making is when Christ came, Christ knew there would be suffering. Suffering was going to be a part of this process coming to the cross. And it's not that, that um, he wants us to not suffer or suffer all the time. It's just the fact of the matter is that suffering is part of life. Just like when Christ came, suffering was part of life. So we, each of us are going to walk through suffering. But when we identify with Christ in his suffering, we always also get to identify with him in his glory. Well, now, what's that mean? In his resurrected body, that he will return again. He rose from the dead in full bodily fashion, and we too will raise from the dead in full bodily fashion. Now, that gets into whole other stuff, but I'm just telling you that, we, that, that this, is not just a, uh, this is not a theory. This is just not another teaching. I mean, we're, we're, going, we're going to raise from the dead if, if we die before he comes. And he is going to reestablish creation and the earth, how he designed it, and we are going to live and rule and reign with him. But listen, that we're going to suffer. But in our suffering, we also identify in that is our future. Now he goes on. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That he already has enough of a glimpse of his own life to know, even though he can't see it, that what's next is going to be worth what's now. See, because he, he even said, listen, I had a life. Did you want to know a life? I had a life. I was on the top of every food chain. I was on top of the educational food chain. I was on top of the, uh, of the ethnicity food chain. I, I lived in the right places. I had the right zip code. I drove the right horse. You know what I mean? He had, all the, he had all the right things. And he said, but you know what? Once I discovered Christ, wow, that other stuff. I mean, if I'm going to say menstrual cloth, he, I mean, he said, there's some dung. You know, it's, it's just in comparison. See, it was good stuff, but in comparison. 
And our future is not worthy to be compared to anything that you might be suffering right now. But you know, when you get locked in on your suffering, you don't think about future. You get locked in on your suffering, all you think about is right now. And if you lock in too long, then you start getting depressed. You start getting discouraged. You start thinking, I don't know if I want to do this. This isn't what it's all cracked up to be. I had different plans, God. I had different visions for this life. So, so having a hope that there's something else in addition to this is how we should be able to live. All right, he goes on. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage of decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Even creation, even the earth, groans because it knew what it was supposed to be, but it had been cursed. And it longs for the day when Christ will come and everybody gets restored and, in fact, creation is restored. You know, one of the five biggest sins for millennials is not recycling. It's true. It's documented. If you don't recycle, that, that's, that's considered a big, big sin. And listen, I think as evangelicals, we ought to be caring for the planet more than anybody cares for the planet. Okay? No problem. But you know what? I didn't create this mess. You didn't create this mess. That's my thing. I don't care how many carbon off prints I'll pay. I ain't changing anything. But when the kingdom comes, it's all going to be restored. So he says, it was, uh, we know the whole creation is groaning as the pains of childbirth right into the present time. But not only so, but we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. Well, wait a minute. I thought we were already adopted. Well, this is where the two-age motif comes in. We were already adopted and we're going to be adopted. So we've been adopted, but there's going to be that future glory when we're adopted. When we have the, our, our, the new bodies and the new relationship with Christ. Again, not seeing through a glass darkly, but now really seeing Christ for who he is. And you know what's the guarantee of that? We've been given a deposit. We've been given the Holy Spirit. He is our deposit. When Christ was teaching in John 14, 15, 16, and 17, he was saying, look, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm going to leave you someone just like myself. He's going to guide you in all truth. He's going to remind you of all things. There's going to be peace that comes. And this is that deposit that if I'm leaving the Spirit with you, just know that I'm returning again. So each time we follow the leading of the Spirit, it should be a reminder again that the Spirit here is a reminder that He is going to return. When you put a deposit down and you put a hefty deposit down on something, you're going to be showing back up. You're not going to forfeit that deposit. The Holy Spirit, I can live in hope now because I see how the Holy Spirit's working in my life. When I see the Holy Spirit working in my life, that is a promise that he's, going, he's working now and he's working for the future. Verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. And here becomes the key, I think, that hinges all of the end of Romans 8. Biblical hope is a confident assurance. It's not a wish. Biblical hope is a confident assurance. It's not a wish. We live in wish world. I wish this would happen. I wish that would happen. I wish they didn't fire Mark Rick. I wish I'd get a bonus. I wish I'd do this. I wish I'd do that. And we live in wishes. There, there is no future in wishes. Because wishes always are then um, subjected to a lot of arbitrary circumstances that might happen or might not happen. Right? They're always subject to arbitrary circumstances. Hope in Christ is not arbitrary. It is not subject to the wind. It's not subject to what I'm going through now. And so I can live in hope now because I'm assured of a future. How does that change your life? When you are assured of a future, here's how it works. Paul says, the present sufferings aren't worthy to be compared. They're not worth, do I have to walk through them? Yes. Do I have to deal with them? Yes. Do I need to overcome them? Yes. But do they need to change my outlook of now and the future? No. No. But we have this hope. But if we have hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. What time? All right, we don't... I always get mixed up when I go between services. I stop at 11, right? All right. 
We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans of words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance to God's will. You know the kid's silent scream? Right now, silent scream, when, when a kid gets hurt and then you, all you see, some of you know, all you see is... Yeah. And you know, if you've been around it, you know, just wait, it's coming. Yeah. Right? Catch the breath and that's... Ah, you know, and it's all... Look, this is, that's the impression I got, this idea that with groans that can't be uttered, that we, sometimes we get hurt or hammered or, or, or blindsided in such a way that we don't even know even how to scream. What's the answer? The Holy Spirit, even in those moments when we can't even articulate what we're feeling or how to get out of it, He articulates that and intercedes for us at the time. He goes before us even when we don't even know how to go before ourselves. How's that for a deposit? goes on. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. I know that most people camp out. I know most people camp out on that. And I'm just going to give you a heads up. That if I'm walking through a hard time or a tragedy, and we all, we all walk through them, right? We all walk through them. I just a heads up. Don't come to me and say, well, you know what? God's got a plan. Just not going to carry a lot of weight with me. Okay, you know what? God knows what he's doing. Also, not carrying a lot of weight with me. I know we say those things because we don't know what to say. But this passage, oh, oh, you know, it, 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 everything's going to work out for your good. Well, you know what? Not everything works out. Not everything works out. But here is what I am assured of. It does work out for my good. But I don't always know the good. Where you hang your hat in this verse is this. And we know that in all things God works. To me, that's where I hang my hat. That I'm not alone. He's working. He hasn't got blindsided. He hasn't, he's not overwhelmed by it. I, sometimes I don't even need to know that. I just need to know that I'm not in it by myself. God is working. And we see things in snapshots. He sees things in cinema. He knows our first day from our last day before the first day ever was. And so he's at work in all things. And he's not, kinda, he's not just troubleshooting this or, or blocking this bad thing. And sometimes he does. But we're going to suffer. And so he doesn't sit. He's, a, he's not just our troubleshooter. He's not our tech support. And he comes in and fixes all the problems. But there are times where he just continues to work. And he's going to work and work and work. And these things will work for our good. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this? That is a great pause. What are we going to say in response to it? He's not even just talking about Romans 8. He's talking about the whole that he's written so far, Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So in light of all of this, that while we were enemies to God, Christ died for us. That the wrath of God was poured out on His Son, not us. That the power of sin is no longer in control. The Spirit's been given as a deposit. He intercedes for us on our behalf. That in all things, in all the suffering, He still works. What are we going to say about that? What's our response to it? If God is for us, who can be against us? He didn't say, if God is for us, all the other opposition leaves. He's doing a comparison again. All that I've said, if God's for us, who of what value and of importance and of strength could stand against him? Nobody. Nobody, nothing can stand. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. Which means then there's, there's no limitation to his love and grace and mercy. If he, would, if he would give his son up for us. And there's no limitation of that. But gave him up for us. How he will not also along with him graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against the who God has chosen? It's God who justifies. He's the one who puts us in right relationship. Nobody else, nothing else. Who is it condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, I know you're going to want, you want me to get to the next part. 
But the, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in times of trouble, even when we can't qualify it ourselves. And then Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for him. What's the difference between the intercession? Here's my take on it. The enemy continually wants to convince God that we're not worth it. That, that somehow he made a mistake. I can't believe you would do something for them. Look, look what the Sabrina did. I'm sorry, I can just see you plainly right here. And Jesus continually, I think it's the same, almost like pause, repeat, pause, repeat. How many eons are we going to go over this? I love them with an infant love. I've paid the price. I know who they are. I love them when they're enemies. I love them now. They're justified by me, not by their actions. I mean, how many times, pause, repeat, pause, repeat, pause, repeat, pause, repeat, is Jesus always interceding for us individually on the throne? Because you know what? Trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness or danger or sword, none of these things separate us from love. None of these change, change, change the equation. Nothing changes that equation. For the sake we face death all day long, we're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we're more than conquerors. More than conquerors. I don't even know what that means. How, 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 is it, how are you more than a conqueror? I mean, conqueror's already the top of the heap, isn't it? But don't fall, into the, don't fall into this pattern right now about grace wins and love wins. I know what the songwriters are getting to in that, and I get in trouble any time I comment about a song in Nashville. Um, <laughs> But, this, but Christ did more than win. See, if, if it's a win, then there's always another game and there always has to be another outcome. If I win. Well, I won today, but i got to play next Thursday. There's a difference between winning and conquering. So death, hell, and the grave were conquered, defeated. It wasn't a win that they're going to have to be played again in order for him to win again. It was won. Okay, it was, it was won. And so all of the things that the enemy would hold against us or hold over our head or put in front of us, these things are just, they're, they're, they've already been conquered, destroyed, annihilated, guts ripped out of them, paraded in the street as worthless, as, as, as an inferior um, opponent. Do you understand that? That Satan is powerful, but he's an inferior opponent. There's no equal and opposite with him, with God. For I'm convinced that neither death, come on, Michael, for, or, or, and whoever else, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is, there, there is no possible breach between the love of God and us. So what does all that mean? Well, it means we can live each day in hope, not in fear. It means that we can live each day as a conqueror, not a victim not just subjected to the suffering that we're in, no matter what that is, emotional, physical, financial, relational. You understand, they're, 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 they're nothing. He's gone through a, a set of stuff I can't even describe, and he's saying if those things have no bearing on separating us out of relationship and love of Christ, then nothing can. And all of our life, all of our life is bridged, and all of our life is cemented in the love of Christ. It is the defining moment of our lives, is the love of Christ. It defines everything. It leads the path for everything. And what Paul has said is not that this is something we should be looking forward to. Paul is telling us this has already been done. This has already been accomplished. So, so even when we sang God will fight for us, I know that even in me it stirs up, I'm glad I'm not in this alone. But, but the thing I want you to remember, he's already fought for you. So since he's already fought for you, of course he's going to still fight, but, the, but we're already more than conquerors. But I get that through suffering and hard times, man, it can knock the wind out of you. But I can live in hope even when I'm sucking wind, when I realize that I have a confident assurance that he is going to return and I'm going to live with him fully restored, and it's so much different now. My life's important. I love my life. I love being here. I do not want to leave early. But when it's time to go, I hope I can follow the footsteps of so many people that I've been in when they've taken their last breath in a hospital or in hospice care to see the strength and vigor in them knowing 
that, that Christ is their Savior and they're going to be with Him forever. That eliminates the fear that the enemy so wants to hang over all of our heads. So wherever you find yourself today, Paul is not saying do these five things, believe these four things, hold your mouth right here. He's saying live, live in a confident assurance of who he is and what he's done. So take that and translate it to anything that you were feeling as we were singing this song to begin with, that he will fight for you. He's at work in all things, and that's how I want to conclude today. We're going to sing, but also some of the elders in here, if we have any elders in this service, and pastors, if you want someone to put another hand on your shoulder and pray for you in whatever phase or time you're in, season of life right now, we're going to be down here to do that for you, okay? Everyone understand? I'm going to pray. And then if you want to come forward for prayer, I want you to come. And the rest, I want you to pray and stay engaged and, and, and worship today. Lord, we thank you that, that your word is, is out in front of us today. The question becomes for all of us is, will we hear it and will we walk in it? And I pray that we will do that. Lord, restore hope. Replace it. Replace fear for hope today. Lord, replace being defeated with a conquering spirit today. In your name we pray. Amen. You are not flesh and bone.